Hi, I'm Ryan Smansky, Curator for Battleship New Jersey Museum and Memorial, and today we're in one of the Protected Cruiser Olympia's coal bunkers, and we're going to be talking about the armor that makes a Protected Cruiser a no, Protected Cruiser. So, uh, there are two different main types of coal bunkers on a coal fire ship like this one. Auxiliaries, like the one we're in, uh, and primary coal bunkers. The primary coal bunkers open directly to the boilers so that you can just shovel the coal right out of there. Auxiliary coal bunkers like this one tend to be stacked up above. Uh, so as you're using the primary coal bunkers, the level of coal in there is going down, somebody else can be up here and shovel the coal into an opening in the top of the primaries to keep that topped off. Oil fire ships like New Jersey uh, have a similar system where the boilers are only drawing their fuel from one specific tank uh, and the other tanks are just pumping into that. Just like Battleship New Jersey uses our fuel as part of our defensive scheme, so too do older ships like Olympia. During this time period, there are two main types of cruisers, armored cruisers and protected cruisers. Both imply armor protection, so what is the difference? Well, an armored cruiser is very similar to a battleship in its armor scheme. It's going to have a belt wrapped around the exterior hull of the ship. That's heavier and more expensive, especially during this time period when newer and better types of steel are being pioneered. Protected cruisers um, just have a turtle back deck like this interior to protect their most important uh, features, their engineering plant. As long as you keep the engineering plant safe, you can use speed as a protection and get out of any encounter that you don't belong in. Olympia doesn't have an armored belt in the truest sense like Battleship New Jersey does, or like for contemporaries, Battleship Oregon or Armored Cruiser Brooklyn. Uh, she, she doesn't have any protection like that. But similar to New Jersey, she's relying on a couple of different layers of steel. Her exterior shell plating steel is the first barrier. Then there is uh, something similar to one of our void spaces in between, and then another interior layer of steel. And in between that small area, there's a very tightly packed uh, cellulose fiber in that void space. Uh, the idea being something relatively small punches a hole in there, the fiber will be able to expand and plug that hole and keep it from allowing water into the ship. Next, after the projectiles punch through those two layers of steel, then it is in a passageway that accesses all of these spaces. And this is Olympia's version of Battle of New Jersey's Broadway. Then the projectile has to punch through the coal bunker. And the coal itself can form part of your protection. Assuming it's a high explosive round, the projectile's already exploded at this point, so it's just catching the shrapnel. Uh, if it's armor piercing or a dud, uh, it maybe has punched through up until now. Well, now it's got to go through all of this coal before it even hits the armor plating. And the armor plating is up to three and three quarters inches in thickness, with the thickest protection being over the engineering spaces, like we said earlier. The actual deck part of this is nowhere near as thick as the side because they're not really concerned about plunging fire at this time period. Um, you don't really have fire control systems that can accurately aim at those ranges. Your guns can't elevate that high. And your best guns of the period, 5 and 51 calibers that arm, uh, rearm Olympia by World War I, have a very, very flat trajectory so they can be fired without complex range fighting equipment. Uh, and so you don't have to worry about something getting the deck armor. If it does, it's probably on a very uh, flat trajectory, so it's going to hit and bounce. Olympia's armor is angled just like New Jersey's, although in the opposite direction, and this too helps give it a greater equivalent thickness. 
a projectile isn't hitting this and then bounce punching through straight three and whatever inches of armor. Because it's at an angle, a projectile hitting it is punching through four, five, six inches of armor. Uh, so it's way more effective for less weight. So ships like Olympia could be built relatively cheaply at a time when the United States has virtually no modern warships, but is also looking to expand into a global power. They've got to build a bunch of cruisers quickly, and they've got to be able to find the funding to do that uh, without all of the resources taken from their colonies, like the other large navies like England and France are able to do at this time. The type of steel being used as armor is also important. If you've watched our video on the various types of armor used on Battleship New Jersey, uh, you know how important this is. Um, Olympia uses one of the earlier methods. Older ironclad type warships from a generation or two earlier were just using straight iron, and iron is pretty brittle. So, by adding alloys, you can create steel, and then uh, the type of armor this is, is called Harvey nickel steel. So it's using nickel as a main alloy with the iron, uh, and they're trying some face hardening techniques. So Bowser New Jersey's Class A armor is face hardened, so the face is hard, the, the out, the outer fit of the armor thickness is hard and brittle, but the back is relatively soft, whereas Class B armor is all soft. Uh, so same token here, except instead of using a gas to face harden the outer fit of the armor, they're, they're using coal to add carbon to the outside of the armor. So again, making an alloy uh, to make outside brittle, but inside still soft. You'll also notice that all of this stuff is riveted together, and this is something we talk about a lot on the channel. Uh, on New Jersey, there's a mix of welded and riveted technology because welding is a brand new thing that they're not entirely sure about yet. But when Olympia was built, you don't see any welding whatsoever. It's all rivets. In practice, Olympia's armor scheme was highly effective in her day. Uh, during the Spanish-American War, the ship was hit during the Battle of Manila Bay, but none of the hits threatened her reserve of buoyancy, what's inside of the armor plate. So she was able to continue to sail, to keep the water on the outside of the hull, uh, and most importantly, to continue to fire her guns. So most of the hits she sustained were from lighter, faster-firing, close-range guns. Uh, and that's pretty common during this time period. If you can score 2% hits with your main battery guns, you're doing pretty good uh, in the pre-dreadnought era. Uh, and so it's not likely you're going to take a major caliber hit. But at the range in which you're using some of these smaller guns that these ships are peppered with, you can't miss. And that's where that uh, cellulose comes in handy because it can automatically plug those holes. Uh, and, like the battleship, our armored citadel here, protected by the turtleback, is just about at the waterline. So very hard to hit to begin with. So, uh, is armor plating like this archaic? This is all pre dreadnought era stuff. Well, it was continued to be used right up until World War II, where capital ships like Hood and Bismarck had angled decks like this one, but they combined it with an armored belt. So if you're shooting at Bismarck, you've got to punch through their armored belt, which is about 13 inches thick, uh, and then your projectile has to go through a turtle deck like this to get into the armored citadel. And that is incredibly good at close range uh, where you are firing into the armored belt. As soon as you open that range up, and you get plunging fire that's going above uh, the armored belt, this becomes a liability. Because plunging fire is supposed to strike the deck at an angle to give it a greater equivalent thickness. But with a turtle deck like this at an angle, your plunging fire might be hitting it straight on. So hitting this three inches of armor is actually hitting three inches of armor. It's not hitting 
uh, more than that. And so you can punch through it relatively easily and without having to punch through too many other plates. This mark was designed specifically to fight in the North Sea where weather conditions uh, make optical range finding difficult and forces ships to fight at relatively close range. Uh, her famous duel with Hood took place within 12 miles. Uh, so very, very uh, close range for ships that could fire over 20 miles. Uh, and so, depending on the environment your ship is intended to operate in, an armor scheme like this may still be effective throughout the entire age of gunnery. American ships designed to operate in the vast expanses of the Pacific uh, go away from this relatively early on. What kind of armor scheme do you think is most effective? Well, let us know in the comment section down below. Allerton, New Jersey receives operating support from the New Jersey Department of State and also from a number of other businesses and private individuals. If you would like to help support the museum and our YouTube channel, there's a link in the description below, both to Battleship New Jersey and one for Independent Seaport Museum. Any donations you make to them will go into supporting the restoration of the Cruiser Olympia. You can also support our museums by liking, sharing, and subscribing to these videos. And there are links in the description below to ISN's channel as well. If you like the content Battleship New Jersey is making, you'll probably also like the stuff that uh, they make on Olympia. Thanks for watching.